next chapter is called Tables and Scope. And while it may be the most challenging chapter maybe in this course, it will also maybe be one of the most rewarding. We'll start by discussing the built-in tables that Setry creates for you whenever you open a new treatment. And we'll also discuss what specific functions these tables have and how you can optimally utilize them. We'll then discuss table functions. Table functions work on the records, on the rows in your tables, and we'll discuss in uh, detail how they do that. Then we come to the scope environment. And the scope environment is really the Champions League of Setry programming. But I've met several um, programmers, several experimenters who've programmed their own experiments, run their own experiments, and don't really understand the scope environment. And that causes them troubles in their experiments and limits what they can achieve in Setry. So we'll do the work to get you up to speed on the scope environment. And from there on, your possibilities with Setry are essentially endless. And finally, we'll discuss user-generated tables, which can be used to supplement the built-in tables to give you even more functionality uh, and flexibility in your Setry programming. Let's start with some general concepts regarding tables. The first is a table's lifetime. The default lifetime of most tables is period. And what this means is that the table is created at the beginning of the period, uh, then you create uh, variables in this table, for example, as we did with our uh, endowment variable or the contribution variable that was filled when uh, subjects entered their contributions. And at the end of the period, of, at the beginning of the next period, the table is emptied again and starts out fresh, basically, for the next period. And again, as uh, a set tree goes through the background, so it starts in the background, goes through the tables, goes through all the programs. Um, programs that create variables in this table will create these variables also in a second period. So the table is recreated and you start afresh. But that, of course, means that the data from the previous period is um, not directly visible in a table that has a lifetime of period. Now, the second type of table uh, has a lifetime of type treatment. And what this means is that um, for as long as the current program, the current treatment, set TT file, is running, this table will retain the information that is saved in it. So if you move to a next period, uh, the table is not uh, deleted. It, it retains all the information from, from the past. And that is often used within a treatment to transfer information from one period to the next, or in particular to give, for example, subjects an overview over their uh, decision history. Um, then you would create a table where you save their decisions in every period, and then you could simply have um, a box that displays uh, this information. And finally, a table of type session or of lifetime session um, survives for as long as set tree is open, even if you um, start and uh, finish different treatments. And a table of lifetime session is often used to transfer information between different treatments. So say you have a first treatment where uh, people perform a certain task and based on their performance in this task, they're assigned to different roles in the second experiment, second part of the experiment then you would write this information that you need for the role assignment into a table uh, of the lifetime session. And then in the second treatment, you can actually access this information that was created uh, in a prior treatment. Now, the next thing we can set here, program execution uh, uh, command uh, controls when programs uh, that run in this table, and I'll show you in a bit uh, what this means um are run and the default is always when a subject enters stage and to be honest i've run a number of experiments but i've never had to change that so the chances are good you also won't need that and finally in this window you see this used variables um, field which you may not see if you just opened um, double clicked any table in your background before, because this field is only shown if you have a lifetime of session and what it is used for is to transfer variables 
or to tell Setry uh, variable names that are in the are saved in this table that has a lifetime of session, and that in the current treatment may actually not have been created or may not be in the code to be created. So Setry would normally say these variables don't exist. If in any program in your treatment you use these variables, Setry will complain and will say, I don't know this variable, right? You have never created it before in the in, in the stage tree, so it would be unknown when this treatment is run. But in the case of um, variables that are in a table of lifetime session, you can of course have variables that are not being created in the current treatment, but were created in a prior treatment. And by putting their names in here, what you do is to tell Setry that if it encounters these variable names in the pro in the code, um, to accept that at the time when the treatment will be run, Setry will have uh, these variables. These variables will have been defined in this table by a prior treatment. Of course, this opens the door to to problems in your uh, program if you then do not run this prior treatment and these variables have not been created. But that, of course, is something that you need to make sure doesn't happen. Furthermore, if we look at one of the output files, so this .xls output file, this is a, um, a, well, an excerpt of this file, we can see what some tables look like. So the example we have here is the subjects table. And you can see it that in this second column here, the second column, uh, and as you can see, this is a column that has a special role. The second column tells you which uh, table this information is from. And the first column tells you which, um, which treatment this is from. So if you run the first treatment on after you've opened your set tree, all of the entries in the XLS file will have a one here in front. Once you start a second treatment, all the entries will have a two here. Now within any given treatment, you can of course have multiple periods. So we see here that in the first run, the first treatment that was run, only period one existed or there was only one period. The second time it was run, actually two periods at least, and I cut it off down here, of course, but at least two periods were run. And um, that allows you to easily identify where any given row or observation um, was created or comes from. Now, in general, the columns of the tables, so these, these columns here, they contain uh, the different variables of your table. And we already discussed some of these variables, so um, the, or we, we actually saw them already. We saw the period variable, the subject variable when we opened our the results of our public goods game, for example. We talked about the group, so that in the public goods game we could have multiple groups uh, doing the same experiment, but basically the people within the groups only interacting with each other. And we'll discuss many more of these variables as we go along, but um, each column corresponds to one variable. Now, each row um, can have a different role in different tables, and we'll come to that on the following slides. Now, finally, uh, something that I mentioned in one of the earlier chapters, Setry saves numeric information in binary variable format, which means that sometimes uh, instead of having a, say, 18.1 there, um, it will say 18.0999999 or 18.1000001. But this is, uh, well, simply due to the, the format of variables, how they are saved, and that's a, a limitation that any computer and programming has, language has that saves data in binary variable format. We'll now discuss the predefined set tree tables. So those tables that you find already uh, in the background when you open a new treatment. And the first of these that I want to talk about is the subjects table. And the subjects table has a lifetime of period, so it's recreated a new every period. And as we've already seen in our public goods game uh, tutorial exercise, 
it has one row per subject. So as you can see down here in this um, example table, each subject in each period, of course, has one row that um, records all the subject data. So the data about this particular subject, for example, subject one has so far or has uh, had 18.5 um, experimental currency units in profit in this period. The total profit is the same in this case, since it's the first period. Um, it has at the end of the period, it had 1,388 uh, currency units in money and five stock um, and so on. Yeah. So it um, contains all the information that belongs or, or pertains to a particular subject. It is also the default table for items. So in an item, if you uh, put a variable as the, the variable that the item should display, or if, in the, if you put the, the text um, option in the layout and uh, put variables directly into the text in the layout field, then they're by default taken out of the subjects table. So if you if you write endowment there, it will first look for a variable called endowment in the subjects table. And um, many of the predefined tables or all of the predefined tables in Setri, or actually just many, <laughs> let me correct that, um, have predefined variables. So, for example, the period variable is one that is present in most tables. The subject uh, variable is uh, present in this table. Uh, so it's specific to this table. It tells you the subject number. The group variable uh, allows you to, uh, to assign all subjects who belong to one particular group the same group number. Yeah, so like here, when here is only one group here. The profit variable we already uh, encountered contains the profit for the current period. The total profit variable contains the profit um, of all periods until the current one, if you're still in the period. Or if you're looking at the total profit variable here in the Excel S file, then it's the total profit at the end uh, of this period. And you can see that profit from period one plus profit from period two, period two equals total profit at the end of uh, period two. The participate variable is something we will use a bit later on. If you set the participate variable for a particular subject to zero in the in a program that is located in the in a stage directly in a stage before the active screen, then this uh, subject will not actually see the active screen of this stage, but will just pass right over it. I'll come back to what this is used for and why it's uh, helpful. The priority variable determines um, which subject enters the stage first in the case where um, we have set the stage to only allow one uh, um, subject in at a time. And the leave stage variable is a special variable that you can set yourself in a program. And if you set this to one for any subject, they immediately leave the current active screen. So you can, for example, have a, a button that says um, end the period. And if one subject clicks that, you set the leave stage variable to one for all subjects and all people immediately leave the stage. That is something that is some, uh, sometimes quite helpful. The Close table is also a predefined table that has a life of period but it always only has one row. So not like the subjects table, which has as many rows as there are subjects. The globals table only has one row and is the main table for general data about the treatment. So for general settings that apply to all subjects, for example. And that's why there is only one row because this the one value there applies to all subjects. Um, it can be reached via the scope operator backslash. Don't worry about that. We'll come back to that. So forget it for, for now. We'll come back to that actually very soon in this same chapter. With regard to predefined variables, we have the period variable again. We have num periods, which tells you or which, well, which um, contains the information how many periods there are in the current uh, treatment. And 
you remember you set the number of periods in the background in this dialog field and since Setry creates this num periods variable for you automatically that allows you to access the number of periods from within the program so for example you can say um, multiply my profit by 1 over in, so in this case here multiply my profit by 1 over 15 so that in the end if I add up all these um, profits that are multiplied by 1 over 15 at the end of the, of the experiment I'll get the average profit per period if that is something you want for example repeat treatment uh, is something I'll come back to later on and auction stop and auction no stop they allow you to do special things with, with the ending of a stage. If you have a stage, a current stage, um, that does not have a timeout, that has a timeout that is, has, uh, contains a negative number. Remember, then we said that the, the stage would run forever, basically, until um, everybody left, for example, by clicking a button. But if you set this auction stop variable equal to 1 in the globals table, then the current stage uh, without timeout ends immediately. Similarly, if you're in a stage that has a timeout of say 30 seconds and you set the auction no stop variable to one, that means the stage will not end even when the 30 seconds have run out. So that allows you to, in the program, modify whether a, a, a stage with undetermined end continues running um, or whether a stage with a defined end uh, also continues running or does not. The session table, again predefined in um, set tree, has a life of session. So this is the one table that is usually used to transfer information from one treatment to the other. It is similar to the subjects table in that it has one row per subject and is usually used to transfer uh, subject specific information and data. And it is the main table for treat uh, for payment information. So that's what Setry by default uses it for. Because if you um, have an experiment that consists of running multiple treatments, uh, you need some way of taking the profit information from one treatment over to the next treatment so that at the end you have collected all the profit information for the entire experiment and can pay your subject accordingly. Um, and that's why it contains uh, the predefined variables apart from subject, uh, but no period in this case. It contains, for example, the pro final profit variable or the show up fee or show up fee invested or money added or money to pay. Um, and so, for example, the final profit variable tells you what the, the profit at the end of the experiment is that should be paid out to, exper to the experimental subject. So multiply this by the exchange rate and you get the payment to the experimental subjects in actual currency units from all of the treatments that you had in your experiment. And another important use for the session table is that it can be used to transfer data to the questionnaire, and we already said between treatments, but to the questionnaire. And that allows you to, for example, in the questionnaire, ask different questions of subjects that had, for example, different roles or that have different values in certain variables. So if you have, for example, um, a, an ultimatum game, if you know what that is, there in this game, you have a subject in the role of proposer who make proposals and responder subjects who respond to these proposals. And if you want to ask them different questions, for example, regarding their motivations for their choices, then you can save uh, the information whether a subject was a proposer or a responder in a variable. So call the variable, for example, proposer, and it's one if the subject was a proposer and zero if the subject was a responder then if you copy this variable from the subjects table to the session table before the end of the treatment, once you start a questionnaire, uh, you can actually ask or on the, in a questionnaire have question forms, so entire screens like stages that are only shown to subjects that are proposers or subjects that are responders.
the summary table has a life of treatment. So it's um, available for the entire uh, current treatment, including all periods, but not from treatment to treatment. It has one row per period, and that already gives you a hint uh, what it, for what it could be used for. It's used usually to save summary data for the experimenter usually, or to display it also to subjects where you say, well, the average payment, the average um, price in the market, for example, here uh, in this uh, treatment was 149.8 in the first period and 191.3 in the second period and so on. So uh, this table is empty by default, except for the period variable. So there, is, there are not many predefined variables. So whatever you want to have in there, if anything, you need to create yourself. A contract table has a life of period again, like the subjects table. So it's uh, renewed every period. And it's unique in that it does not have a predefined number of rows. Uh, it is the table that is used for transaction data. So imagine um, that you have a market experiment where subjects can buy and sell some good in, in a market and they can buy and sell and resell and rebuy multiple times. So you don't know before you run the experiment how many transactions there will be well, then you can use this contracts table to record these transactions. And the, the example that I've given you down here is just such an application. So we have the period variable. This is the only variable that is predefined. And then you have who was the seller in this particular transaction. That was num subject number 10. The buyer was subject number 8. They belong to group 1. The price that they traded for was 20. The contract was actually traded. I'll come back to tell you what this means a bit later. Contract ID was 1, the trade ID was 1, and the maker was 10. So in this case, the seller created the, the offer to sell. The seller said, basically, I want to sell for 20. Uh, and then everybody saw this on their screens, and buyer number 8 at some point said, yes, I'll buy for this price. And then a transaction was concluded. Now take, for example, this entry here, cell number four was the maker. So she offered to sell for a price of 120, but the contract was never traded. So people saw it on their screens, but maybe the period was too short or the price was unattractive or whatever. It turns out that nobody traded this contract. And the way I saved this, uh, or the, the programmer of this um, program saved this was by having the buyer be minus two and minus two is just some kind of status code saying this was an, uh, an order that was still left open or that was deleted by the computer or something like this. So in any case, you can see that each transaction, actually each offer to transact uh, is recorded in this table. And if transactions actually do happen, then the entries are modified by adding a buyer or a seller. Um, in addition to the maker that was already there and setting traded equal to one and creating a trade ID. So here we see this was the first trade, this was the second trade, this was the third and fourth trade and so on. And the contracts table does gives you a lot of flexibility um, to, well, to record information that has no predefined uh, frequency or number. So for example, also in negotiations, you have one subject making an offer, the other making a counter offer. And if you want to allow people to do this as often as they like, then you don't know how many offers there will be, but you can record them in the contracts table. And one more thing I want to mention here, there are contract boxes or contract list boxes and contract creation boxes. We'll talk about them. Um, but what they allow you is to very efficiently access the information in the contracts table or in a user-defined table that serves a similar role. But by default, if you create such a box, it will use the contracts table. And that's why I wanted to mention it at this point. Now that we've discussed tables and talked about what they look like, we can talk about table functions. And before we discuss table functions, let me talk to you a little bit about programs.
Remember, we created our own programs in our public goods game um, experiment where we used a program to set the endowment value of subjects and the, initialize a number of other variables and set the, the um, efficiency factor. Or also, we had another program to calculate the profit. Now, these programs, and we didn't really look at that at the time, run in a table. And what this means is that uh, the set tree runs through this program for each row of the table that you specify here. So it starts out with the first row, which means in the case of the subjects table, this is the first subjects data and runs through the program here. And if the program, for example, says profit equals five times endowment, then it takes the endowment of the first subject, multiplies it by five, and saves the result in the profit variable entry for the first subject. Then it would start again, so return to the top of the program, uh, go to the second subject in the table, the second row in the table, and run through the whole program again, and do this for every row of the subject's table. Now, our table functions do the same. If you, for example, um, use the table function sum, and we did this in our profit calculation, we said sum, and then we had these parentheses, uh, these brackets, and said um, same group, comma, contribution. This way, we added up all the contributions of the subjects in the same group, and in the end, saved it in the sum c variable. What we did in this case was we just wrote sum and nothing before it, and that tells, re, tells Setri to run this table function in the table that is specified here in uh, the, the program definition, if you want. If we specifically want Setri to tell, uh, want to tell Setri which table to run this table function in, we can always do that by just specifying the table name, then full stop or dot or, or yeah, full stop, uh, and sum and parentheses. Now, these, this is a list of the different functions that are available in Setry, and they always, or yeah, they all have the possibility to, to add a condition here. You can say sum up all the instances of a variable in a table, but do it only under some conditions. You don't have to specify a condition, but you can. The condition we specified in our profit calculation was same group, which means that the subjects or the sum would only be calculated over all those subjects who are in the same group as the subject that the, the program is currently run for, the row in the subject table that the program is currently run for. But we could, for example, say sum where um, and contribution is greater than five, comma, contribution. And that would mean sum up all those contributions uh, where contributions were greater than five. We can use the average function to calculate the average of some variable. We can calculate the product of some variable over an entire table. We can calculate the minimum, median, or maximum of a certain variable in a table. We can use the find function, which has uh, the role, or the, what it does is it goes through the table and looks for the value of a certain variable. And usually we would also specify a condition because what find does it is it looks up the first instance of the variable here that it finds in a table going top to bottom through the rows. And if there is no condition, it will just take the first row. If, it, if there is condition, it will look for the first um, case where this condition is met. So condition could be, um, contribution is greater than five. And then we look up the, whatever, the, some, some subject characteristic that we saved, for example, for this subject. So this is what the find function would do. And it, it would return the value of this variable where this condition is met for the first time. The count variable 
simply counts the number of rows in a table. So if you uh, apply the count variable to the subjects table, which again we did in the public goods game, because in the public goods game, we just said count um, same group, which means that we told it to, to count the number of people that are in the current group, in the group that the, the current subject is in. Um, yeah, then it does that. If you just say count opening and closing parentheses without condition there, it will count the number of subjects uh, in the subjects table, so in the experiment. We can calculate the regression um, slope and the intercept. Um, so we can actually run a simple uh, linear, re linear regression in Setri using this. Or we can, for example, use the standard deviation as a table function. So all, the standard deviation of all the variables in, in a table, all the instances of a particular variable in a table. And these are just examples. You find the full list of table functions in the manual. But table functions are a very efficient way to run calculations in Setri if the information is organized in, is cleanly organized in tables, which is uh, a good reason for why I like to use tables and why at the very beginning I told you I don't so much use arrays because arrays cannot be accessed using these table functions. Um, but tables, uh, sorry, um, yeah, information in tables can, and that makes it very easy to do run calculations on them. Let's look at an example of how tables and programs interact. I've got a simple um, table here. This is, well, this is just part of a table, in this case, the subjects table. Uh, the variables G, M, capital M, uh, lowercase x, and Y. And at the moment, only the G variable is filled. And the first subject has G of 5, the second of 12, and the, uh, the third of 7. And now let's see what happens when we run this uh, program. Remember that I said this program runs through the subjects table row by row. So it will start in the first row and set m equal to 20. It will set x equal to m minus g, which in this case is 20 minus 5 or 15. And in y it will write the sum of all m. And sum is a table function. I could have written subjects.sum that would have done exactly the same thing, but I put sum here because it automatically uses the subjects table since it's in the subjects table, even though, uh, to be honest, I recommend to always use the table here to make the, your code clearer, um, but this way is, of course, uh, a bit shorter. So what happens here? It calculates the sum of all m variables in the entire subjects table. So it goes here, looks at the subjects table, says, well, there was only 20 here, there's nothing here, nothing here, so the sum is 20, and that's why y will be set equal to 20. Now it's done running this program on the first row of the table, and it will go to the second row and run the same program again. Now what happens, and this is where it gets interesting, well m will again be set to 20, x will be set to 20 minus 12 is 8, and sum m will now, of course, sum up the m's that have that are available now at this point in time. And now there are more m's available or more entries in m, which means that now y will be set equal to 40. And finally, if we run it again, we will see that in the third row, we get the 20 for m, the 13 for x, and the 60 for y, because of course now it's summing up over all the m's here. So this dynamic nature of the table being updated row by row can create um, unexpected behavior, but can of course also be expected if you know what Setri does and can be exploited to, to run certain types of calculations. But in, in many cases, I find it's actually confusing, especially for beginners of Setri and creates, uh, can create errors that, that people find hard to trace. Yeah, because it's not clear to them why um, why why the y variable here um, takes uh, these values when when they say well I ch I first filled m with twenty and only then ran the sum but well first means here row by row it's it's first within this row 
um, but not uh, across the entire table. And that's why you get, get this behavior here. Tables and what is called the scope environment are probably the least understood aspects in C-Tree by beginners and also by some regular users. Yet understanding them is critical to be able to realize some great ideas in programming C-Tree or sometimes just to figure out why your code is not doing what you expect it to do. Now it's not hard to learn about them, it just takes a few minutes. For there are four secrets and I'm going to let you in on all of them. And I promise. If you haven't understood the scope environment yet, this is going to be a real eye-opener. Ready? Then let's get started with the first secret. Secret one. Tables are like chalkboards. Look at the chalkboard on the right and imagine it to be a set tree table. Each chalkboard or table has a name and it has columns of information written on it. Now these columns are the variables which correspond to vectors of data. Notice the chalkboard here is nailed fast to the top of the slide. Alternatively, look at the wall in front of your desk and imagine a chalkboard were nailed to it right below the ceiling. Do you have that? Okay, fix that image in your head and follow me to secret two. Well, secret two is that this chalkboard that you see here is the globals table and it is nailed to the wall right below the ceiling. That means it is literally at the top of your wall. Nothing can go above it. Now we need only one more ingredient or secret to make a number of things clear. Secret three, any table can be hung below any other. Imagine that all other tables in Setry are on chalkboards with a piece of string attached, which can be used to hang them below the global stable chalkboard or any other chalkboard for that matter. Now the easiest way to hang a chalkboard on your wall in Setry is to insert a new program. As you can see here, by default, this new program runs in a subjects table. What this means is that the first chalkboard we hang below our globals table is the subject table chalkboard. Of course, you can at any time change the table the program runs in, say, to the session table, and that switches out the chalkboard on the wall. Okay. But for the time being, let's stick with the subjects table, since this is probably the table you will work with most frequently. Now, what if I create a new variable in this program? Let's say I create a new variable that I call level and whose value I set equal to one. What happens now? Well, since this program runs in a subjects table, c will write this new information onto the subjects table chalkboard. But how do I now reach the globals table? How can I change what is recorded on this chalkboard? Well, that brings me to the second term I talked about at the beginning, scope. Or more precisely, the scope operator, and our fourth and final secret. Scope operators let you navigate between tables. Now, the first scope operator is the colon, and it allows you to move upward to chalkboards hung higher up on the wall. Look at this. If I fill the level, variable level with the value zero, but pre preface the variable name with a colon, what will happen is that Zetree modifies this variable not on the current chalkboard, which would be the subjects table, but one chalkboard higher up, which in our case brings us to the goals table chalkboard. Let's take a minute to recap what we've just seen. When I create or modify variables directly in my program, like this level one here, level equals one here, they are modified in a table or on the chalkboard that my program runs in, so the subjects table in this example. When I put the colon scope operator before the variable name, I thereby tell Setry to look for and modify this variable one chalkboard up from the current one. Now I can use Setry code to hang another chalkboard below the current one. Let's try to write a variable into yet another table. For that, I need to tell Satri that I want a certain piece of code to be run not in a subjects table, but in a different table, say the contracts table. Here in this example, I use the table function do, but any other table function will also open a new table. Remember, you recognize table functions by them being prefixed by a table name. And now you also know why you should prefix table functions by a table name because only this way will Setry know which chalkboard to hang on your wall. In our example, 
whatever code I put between the curly brackets here will be run not in a subjects table, but in a contracts table. So let's again create a variable. I write level equals two here, and what does it do? Yeah, right. It puts this variable into the contracts table. Now imagine I use the colon scope operator here within the curly brackets of the contracts do function. If I preface my level variable with one colon, that will take us up one chalkboard to the subjects table. Yet if I preface the level variable with two colon symbols, that will take us all the way to the globals table and modify the variable there. Make sense? But as you can imagine, these colons could get a bit tedious to type uh, and also hard to read, especially when you have a number of chalkboards on your wall, particularly when you are trying to access the globals table. And this is something that happens rather often since the globals table is usually at least the second most important table after the subjects table. So C3 offers a second scope operator, the backslash. The backslash is your shortcut to the globals table, since it will always take you all the way to the top chalkboard, the one that is nailed solidly to your wall. So using this backslash scope operator, I can in one step directly modify the instance of my level variable that is saved in the globals table. Well, congratulations. You now understand tables and scope in C3. Now let's look at a slightly more realistic program, and one that is a bit more complex than you may have seen so far, but we'll mostly focus on in which tables the variables are located and how we can access them using the scope operator. Now remember before we start that each program runs in a table, and this one runs in a globals table. Why do I often run programs in the globals table? Because the globals table always only has one row, one record. And that means that the program only runs once. And that is often useful when I want to calculate some things that don't need to be calculated for each subject separately. Uh, then I run the program in the globals table because this way it runs only once. Remember in the subjects table, for example, the program would run once for each subject, each row in the table. Now we can specify conditions here in this field and these conditions control which records uh, the program is run for or whether it is run at all. So if the condition is not fulfilled, then the program will not be run. And finally, there is this owner variable up here. And this applies mostly when this program is, for example, in, uh, in a button or yeah, under some special circumstances where you deliberately want the program to run only for certain subjects then and, and this subject kind of triggered the, the running of the program, then you can specify a variable here, a variable name, that must be a variable in the table that is specified here. And Zetri will then compare uh, the current subject subject number with the value of this variable and only run the program if they match. But don't worry, you really don't need this very often. So let's focus on the program itself. The program contains first off a number of variables that are in the globals table. Remember, if, um, if I don't specify any scope operator, then the, the variables written or taken from directly the table that the program runs in, so the globals table. And this is the case for this endowment type here. It's also the case for this k equals one here. Why? Well, because I haven't changed the table. I've started a loop, which means that Zetri will run everything between these two curly brackets um, until this condition, or as long as this condition is fulfilled. I've opened another loop, but I've never changed the table. So these two variables are uh, located in the globals table. Now down here, I use table functions subjects.find and down here subjects.do to access a new table, the subjects table. And that means that if I, if I specify a variable here like subject, this is in the subjects table. Also within these brackets here, the subject variable here or the initial money vari variable here are also in the subjects table. And what I do at the beginning here is I compare the subject variable to the K variable that is one table up from the subjects table. That's why I use the scope operator here. So this is actually this K variable here in the globals table. So I can compare the current subject to the K variable um, 
up in the globals table. So these two are in the subjects table. Whereas the, the else here, for example, this runs in the, in the globals table again. Because this is part of the if statement. And this variable backslash done equals one must be in the globals table because the backslash, remember, always brings us all the way to the globals table. Now, finally, here I have some variables that are in the endowments table because I opened the endowments table here. The endowments table is not a table that is predefined in Ctree. It's one that I created myself and we'll come to user defined um, tables uh, at a different time. But what you can see here is that I started out in the globals table. Then I opened the subjects table here. I basically hung my subjects table chalkboard below the globals table chalkboard. And now within the subjects table program here, this is all within the subjects table. I'm opening up another table, the endowments table, and looking for a, a, a record in this table, a row in this table, where the type variable in the endowments table has the same uh, content as the endowment type variable, one step up from the endowments table, and that of course is the subjects table. Yeah, so I've stepped from the endowments table to the subjects table, and I compare the type variable endowments to the endowment type variable in the subjects table. And this command here then returns the cache uh, value of that record in the endowments table where type equals the endowment type in the subjects table. Now, this is my final slide on the topic of programs, tables, and scope operators. And this is a very uh, nice example uh, of, a, of a line of code that illustrates all the different uh, table and scope uh, steps we can take, basically. So we have a program that runs in the in table A. Okay, and this is the, the green table, if you want, the table A. And so if I say x equals we, then these variables are both in table A since they're, well, since I never used any other table so far. But then if I write plus b dot sum, the tell set tree, step into the B table, and whatever I put into the brackets here um, is in the B table in principle, as we'll see, you know, everything is in fact. So if I write V here, it's taken from the B table. So there is a variable V in the A table and a variable V in the B table. And it's multiplied with the version of V from the A table here, because I put the colon in front of it. Colon means step out one, uh, level or step up one level. And then I have minus C dot product, which means now step furthermore into the C table. So hang another chalkboard. So the, the first chalkboard we had here was table A, which is either the globals table itself or it's hung directly below the globals table maybe. Then we have table B, which is hung below table A. And now we're hanging table C, the chalkboard for table C below the table B chalkboard. And if I write we here, this is taken from the C table. If I step up one step, I get to the B table. If I step up two steps, two scope operators, I get to the A table. A few more things. Uh, the function same you may have encountered already. What the same function does is it basically compares, you put same, for example, group in here. So in between parentheses, you put a variable name, which could be, for example, group. And what it does is it looks for the group variable in the current table and compares it to the group variable in the table one step up and um, returns whether they are the same. So it's basically the same as saying group equals equals colon group if I put the group variable in here. And that's a very convenient way of uh, doing what we very often do and what you saw in some of these programs, comparing the value of uh, a variable in one table to the one, um, the one table above it. And the, the possibility to use the same function is also why we often use the same variable names in different tables, because then I can use the um, same command to compare them. Now, if a variable is only defined in one table, you can actually 
omit the scope operator and just use the table name, uh, the variable name, and Setry will look up the variable in the current table first and then will step up through uh, the tables until it reaches one where it finds this variable. So um, I would call it, if you want to do sloppy programming, you can omit the scope operators in some cases. Namely, as I said here, if a variable name is only defined in one table, then Citri will actually find that variable. But this is dangerous because um, you're not directly specifying where Citri should look for it. So for example, if you program your program, everything works fine. And then later on, you introduce the same variable name in a new table or in a different table, then suddenly Cetri may be, may be choosing the wrong variable uh, of this name in your old code because you did not specify where exactly Cetri should look for it. So my strong recommendation is to always use the correct scope operators to access uh, the variable in that table that you exactly want. Yeah? And finally, if you want to access uh, the variables from the previous period, so that the tables from the previous period, you can um, prefix them by old in capital letters, so just like here. Uh, and that allows you to get the data from the last period. So if you if you say old subjects dot find with a capital old, then you can look up a variable in the previous period's subjects table. And that, for example, allows you to easily transfer information from one period to the next, even from tables that have a, a life of period and not a life of treatment or a life of session. This table is taken directly from the manual, the Setri manual. And what it shows you is the scope environment of programs in the background of a Setri treatment. So what this means is that if you open or if you create a program in the summary table that is located, the program is located in the background of Setri, then the scope environment here is summary globals, as you would expect. So the top chalkboard, the top table is globals, and below that is the summary table, which means if in this program, in the summary table, um, you use the colon operator, you go up one step to the globals table. The same goes for the subjects table, which is both uh, as we would expect it, but the session table is special in a sense. In the session table, if you put a colon in front of a variable and the, the program itself is located in the Cetri background, then you get to the subjects table and exactly to that record, to that row of the subjects table that corresponds to the same row in the session table. So in, in the session table, if you're currently in the row for subject three and you use the colon operator, you will fetch the variable from the subjects table uh, for subject three. And we'll come back to this once more in this uh, course, which is when we talk about uh, questionnaires. So um, don't worry too much about this slide, but if you have uh, a concern or have a, a clear question about the scope environment for programs in the background, then you can check out the manual or this slide to be clear what the ordering of the tables is. User-generated tables give you a powerful tool in Ctree to manage information. They can make it much easier to find information, for example, by helping you transfer information from previous periods to the present period uh, through a table that has a life of, for example, treatment. And they can help you prevent the duplication of information, which you may uh, not be able to avoid using only the built-in table sometimes. They are also much more powerful than using, for example, array variables, uh, because for uh, one, one important reason for that is that you can use table functions. And you already saw table functions. They can very efficiently allow you to aggregate information over an entire table, which is not possible using array variables. And finally, uh, there are options to import and export data from and to uh, tables in Citri. And the table really here is the element uh, or, or the level at which you can import. So you cannot import uh, individual variables very efficiently, but you can entire tables. And so sometimes it makes a lot of sense to generate a user-generated table 
that only contains the information you need to import or export and use that for um, communication with other programs, for example, or just to load um, a set of information or data that you need in our experiment very uh, quickly and efficiently. This exercise is called dividends and it trains your understanding of tables in Setry. It does so by making you come up with a, a way to efficiently save and retrieve information using tables and variables or different variable types. So after that, you should know different approaches to saving and retrieving information. And you should also be able to distinguish the advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches. This exercise is taken from a market experiment. And in this experiment, there are multiple periods and the, at the end of each period, the stock that people can trade pays a randomly chosen dividend. But this dividend can take on only four possible dividend amounts. And these are, as you can see here, 0, 8, 28, or 60 experimental currency units. Now your task is to find a way to save these uh, four dividend amounts in Setri, either in variables or in a table, that's up to you and then uh, allow for, so program uh, in your program, a way that Cetri can randomly pick one of these dividend amounts and save it in a variable called a dividend draw, yeah? with equal probability, so uniformly distributed uh, probability. Also, I would like you to uh, calculate the expected dividend, so the, the average of these four values here, and save it in a variable called mean dividend. And now um, think about the way you can program this such that your program is flexible. Flexible in a sense that if I change one or even all of these amounts, the random picking and the calculation of the expected dividend still works fine. Uh, and you don't have to modify too many things in your program ideally. And also, Think about what you would need to do to extend this scenario to eight or even a variable number of possible dividend amounts and still um, allow for Setri randomly picking one and calculating the mean with a, a most efficient, um, the most efficient way of programming this that you can think of. Finally, you don't need a stage for this. You can actually do all of this in the background, you just need a program and possibly other stage tree elements that you would like to add, but stage is not strictly necessary. Just a little hint, the random function, so just typing random and opening and closing brackets, returns a random number that is drawn from a uniform distribution over the range between zero and one. So that might help in the uh, choose a random dividend uh, subtask. Please pause your video now. So the first solution is in a global stable program using standard variables. And by the way, this condition, of course, is just there for, um, for testing. So in a real experiment, you would not have condition equal to false because that would mean that the program never runs. So what do I do? I create four variables in the table and fill them with the four dividend amounts. Uh, and then I come to the random draw. Now the random draw is done by using the random function multiplying by four, rounding up, so you get um, same size intervals, and saving the result in a variable called r. Now r can take values from one to four, the integer values from one to four, and then I just have four if statements, statements, if statements saying if r equals one, then dividend drawn is set equal to dividend one, if it equals two, it's set equal to dividend two, three, and four. And to calculate the mean, I just add up all the dividend amounts, divide by four, and that is the mean dividend. Now, this is a pretty simple solution, and it has the, well, the advantage of being simple, but it has the disadvantage that when you want to change anything, particularly the number of dividends, uh, you have to make a number of changes. So if you want to add a dividend here, a fifth dividend here, you have to put it here. You have to change this four to a five, you have to add another line here. You have to add a fifth dividend here, and you have to divide by five instead of four. 
So quite a number of things you have to change if you add another dividend. Now the second solution also uses the globals table, but array variables. Remember array variables are like a vector with um, elements that you can address by, by index. So in this case, I would say, I would specify a number of dividends, which is in this case four, then create an array variable called dividend with uh, this many entries, and then fill these entries. Now this is a bit longer, but then this helps me because now I can say um, R equals, again, the random number, but this time times the number of dividends. And you can already imagine if I change the number of dividends, I don't have to change this here. I just change it here once, and here it already takes, for example, a five instead of a four. And then the dividend draw is very simple. I don't need all those if statements. I can just write dividend drawn equals dividend, and then here the index number. Yeah, and that will pick either one, well any one of those depending on what the realization in the random variable R is. Now for the mean calculation, we I start out with a mean dividend of zero, and then I have a for loop which runs from one through the number of dividends and adds up all the dividends. It just adds the dividend number i to the mean dividend that starts out as zero. And then in the end, I need to divide by the number of dividends. Now, this example is a bit more complex or a bit longer than the first example, but it has the big advantage that if I add a dividend here, I have to add one line here and change this one number and that's it. Everything else is fine because the number of dividends um, is always here as a variable. So it correctly um, uses this, whatever I said here. And um, through the for loop, it will loop through all of the uh, dividends that I set and add them up and thus calculate the mean without me having to adjust anything else. The third solution uses a user-defined table, which I call dividends. Of course, you can also use the contracts table if you don't need it for anything else. But other than that, you can simply create your own table, call it, for example, dividends, give it a lifetime of period, and then use that to save the dividend information. And the way you do that is that you use the dividends.new table function to write a new row, a new uh, line into this table, which contains just one variable, dividend, and sets um, its value to zero in this first line. Then it creates another line that sets the value in the second line to eight, one that sets it to 28, and one to 60. So you have four lines in this table with one variable called dividend and the values 0, 8, 28, and 60. Then the next step here creates an ID column, an ID variable in this table that simply contains the values 1, 2, 3, 4, so that you have a way of addressing the individual dividends. Then here I calculate the number of dividends in the table, so the number of rows in the table. Then I randomly draw the dividend by using the, the random number generation and then just picking in the dividends table, finding that line that has ID equal to the value in R and picking the dividend from that and saving it in dividend draw. And finally, for the mean dividend, we can make use of the table function average to simply calculate the, the mean of the dividend values in the table by saying dividends.average of dividends. So this is very short. Now this solution is not so much shorter than the previous ones, but it's much more flexible. The only thing you need to change if you want to expand this to, to a different number of periods, so to add periods, is you need to add more lines here. Everything below that, all of this code here, um, stays completely the same. You only need to add additional lines here and you can easily expand your table to eight or even a hundred dividends like this. And a final twist on this version of the solution with the user defined table is to use a table loader that is an, a stage tree element. So you need to click uh, treatment new table loader. And then I can read in a file on my hard drive. Now this is a normal text file that I prepared that contains my dividend information. And in this case, once I've read in this file, which basically substitutes the, the writing of the individual dividends in, in, in my program, 
I just need to um, calculate the number of dividends, draw the random dividend, calculate the mean. So this is as before, but now this is sometimes helpful. I can, I don't have to change anything in Setri when I change the dividends. I just need to change it in this external file. And I can do that, for example, by using an Excel uh, sheet and exporting that into a text format. And I get exactly the format here that I need to um, import this into set tree. So I recommend to make maximum use of tables in set tree instead of, for example, using array variables. Uh, they provide a better out output format than array variables. Um, they allow you to use a table loader to quickly import new parameters or data and even large amounts of data very quickly uh, into your set tree program. They can be used to transfer data between periods and treatments. So instead of using this old subjects uh, table, for example, you can pre prepare your own history table that contains only that information that you need, or even your own results table, which can be very helpful. So you prepare in Setri a results table that contains the most important data that you need for your analysis later on, uh, and then Sometimes it's easier to do that in Setri than in your statistics software later or your uh, analysis software later on, like, like R or Stata or SAS or, or SPSS or whatever you want to use. Also, using tables allows you to use table functions, and they can very much speed up your, um, well, your programming, but also the execution is, is rather fast. And um, a short reminder here, about table lifetimes, these uh, the contracts table, globals table, subjects table, they have a life of period. The summary table have a has a life of treatment, and the session table has a li life of session. But your own tables can have any life that you choose. So you can, um, well, you should of course choose the optimal life for the task that you need your table to perform. So for example, a history table which you uh, want to use to display to the subjects at the end, for example, an overview of their decisions over all the periods of the experiment, that would likely have a life of treatment. 